Great. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Matt Flory and I'm the policy co-chair for the Minnesota Public Health Association. Uh, really appreciate uh, the great response we've had uh, for today's webinar. We'll get started in just a minute. Uh, I want to um, uh, thank uh, Angela Fields, uh, the Associate Executive Director for the Community Health Worker Alliance and Ann Ganey, the Program Manager, Trainer and Facilitator for joining us as our presenters today. Uh, and we'll get started in just a minute here. Just a couple of quick uh, housekeeping items. Uh, this Zoom meeting uh, is gonna be recorded. So please mute your microphone when, not, uh, when you're not talking. Uh, we will have time for Q&A and discussion. Um, it's up to you if you want your camera on or off. Uh, we don't wanna accidentally capture anyone's image if they're not, uh, not interested in having that. And if you feel comfortable, rename yourself to include uh, your pronouns. Uh, you can put questions and comments in the chat. Uh, so we'll ask our presenters uh, to answer questions at the end. We'll get do the presentation and they assure us we got plenty of time for discussion at the end. So you can put them in the chat or hold your questions uh, till the end. Uh, now I'm going to start uh, at the beginning of every meeting. Uh, the Minnesota Public Health Association uh, reads our ancestral land statement. Uh, we ask that you take a moment to honor and acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Anishabe. Indigenous people have a longstanding history and connection to the land since time immemorial and are the original stewards of lands and waters. Many American Indians were forcibly exiled from their lands because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism and US governmental policies, but they persevered. We make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota and Anishabe people, ancestors and descendants, as well as the land itself. Uh, with that, uh, I want to um, introduce uh, our uh, two speakers today. Uh, we have uh, Ann Ganey and Angela. Uh, we're gonna uh, we'll come back to some of these upcoming events uh, afterwards. So I'm gonna stop sharing my slides and let Ann pull up hers. Let's see. I'll just like technology always gives me one minute of pause, right? There we go. Okay, can everybody see our presentation? I can see it, yes. yes. Okay, so. Yeah. There's some boxes on the screen though, yeah. Uh, black boxes. Yeah, I can't get rid of, maybe I can put it down here. Okay. Is that better? Um, well, for the most part, there's still one to the right of the screen. It's a larger one. I don't know if it's gonna interfere with anything. It yeah. is. Maybe I can put on. Is there a way I can change my view? I guess if I stop sharing, I can change my view. Yeah, I, I don't think I can get rid of that box. Okay. So am I sharing again? No. Not yet. <laughs> mm. Sometimes Zoom Zoom is clunky. Definitely. There you go. Okay. So um, here we go. There we go. All righty. Well, thank you, Anne, for um, loading up the slides for us. And welcome, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Um, my name is Angela Fields, and I'm the Associate Executive Director of the Minnesota Community Health Work Alliance. I've been in my role since December of 2022. It's a fairly new role for the Alliance, and I'm excited about where this role will take us as um, an organization. Um, to share a little bit about myself, I am um, a community health worker, but I'm also an allied health professional with over 37 years of working alongside of communities and families to find solutions to address health and social inequities. 
I've supported the efforts of numerous community-based and health organizations, providing my expertise in areas of community health, adolescent health, maternal and child health, women's health, and, and the integration of evidence-based models to include community health worker models. I am also one of the authors of the um, mental health module of the Minnesota Community Health Worker Certificate Curriculum, and I also assist interns during their education to um, workforce transition. I'm joined here with my colleague, Ann Ganey, our program director, and I'll turn it over to her to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having us today. I wanted to say a special thank you to Matt Flory for, and all the folks at MPHA for arranging this today. Um, I have worked with community health workers for many, many years, um, largely um, in rural Minnesota and across the state as a whole. I live in Mankato, and I used to direct programs at Region 9 Development Commission, um, where we did rural health outreach and employed CHWs before we knew what CHWs were. And then I was a curriculum author for the certificate curriculum, and I've taught that at several community colleges, and now I do project management work with the Alliance. So I've been involved with CHWs many years and I stay involved with them because I have seen the impact of their work and how it improves the quality of life and health of people. And also just community health workers are really fine people to be around as well. So that's a little bit about me and I'm going to turn this back to Angela. Thank you, Ann. Um, next slide, please. What we will cover today, today we'll, during our time together, we'll talk about the Minnesota Community Health Worker Alliance. We'll talk about the HRSA CHW certificate scholarships, and we'll talk about supporting CHWs. Next slide, please. Meet the Alliance. The Alliance is a, a broad-based statewide partnership of CHWs and stakeholders organizations. We're governed by a volunteer nonprofit board. Our vision is equitable and optimal health outcomes for all communities. Um, our mission is to build community and system capacity for better health through the integration of community health worker strategies. Next slide, please. What does the Alliance actually do? Um, we provide advocacy services. We have partnerships. We provide opportunities for education opportunities for community health worker leadership development. We have a community health worker or CHW registry, and we also offer consulting services. Next slide, please. Who are community health workers? Well, community health workers are trusted, knowledgeable frontline health professionals who typically come from the communities that we serve. Community health workers are health equity, is a health equity workforce working to bridge cultural and logistic barriers, expanding access to coverage and care, and improving health outcomes. Community health workers, commonly called our CHWs, help build individual and community capacity, increasing health knowledge and self-sufficiency through a range of activities, such as outreach, community education, informal counseling, support services, and advocacy. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite slides, and it really shows um, and demonstrates um, the placement of community health workers. We're that intermittent area piece between health and social systems and the communities. Community health workers are uniquely equipped to advance health equity. We typically reside in the communities that we serve and share the same language, ethnical, cultural, and educational backgrounds, and our life experiences. Community health workers are the link to continuing of care. These trusted relationships enable us to be effective links between our own communities and the systems of care. These critical relationships are significantly lowers health disparities in Minnesota because CHWs provide access to service. We improve the quality and cultural competency of care. We create an effective system of chronic disease management, 
and we improve the health, knowledge, skills, and self-sustainability of underserved populations. Next slide, please. So um, we have learned that community health workers are most effective when we stick with what we call the community health worker character. This is hiring community health workers who come from the communities they serve and have that shared life experience that Angela was just talking about. At the Alliance, we really take great care to support the authentic voice and unique nature and the professional identity of the CHW workforce because we have learned that if we stray from that, we don't get the same results. And, and as the interest in community health workers has grown, there have been increased uh, movements away from that grassroots integrity of the field. Um, and there are many forces that push that, but we really stand for CHW's authentic voice and that CHW character, which we name as coming from the communities they serve and having that shared life experience. So that's a really important piece when thinking about hiring and recruiting CHWs. And we see a lot of organizations hiring CHWs and then helping them get the certificate. So for billing and reimbursement, you probably know that we do have billing and reimbursement in Minnesota, according to this statute. It does cover um, health education, diagnosis related health education. We know it's not working perfectly and you're gonna hear more about that as we go on in our presentation here. There are, there's a, an, a range of providers who can sign off on CHW billing, such as doctors, advanced practice nurses, dentists, psychologists, social workers, and others. Um, so they can, CHWs can work in a lot of different places. Um, and without reimbursement, we see CHWs now working in public safety, public schools, um, elder services. So there's a lot of places where CHWs can be very effective. Um, so for supporting CHW development, we have a new opportunity that we're really excited to share with you. We have, in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Health, we are a HRSA grant recipient, and we will have 90 scholarships this year starting in August for community health worker certificate students to get the certificate. We'll have 90 again next year, and then we'll have another year of half of that. So we want to tell you about that today and we'll answer questions about it. We will have an online application for people to apply for a scholarship to the Alliance. Uh, they will also need to apply to the school of their choice and we'll tell you what schools have the CHW certificate. Um, and then 90 students will get um, their a full scholarship to um, a community college. The scholarships won't cover full tuition at some of the universities that have the certificate. But Angela is going to tell us more about the student support funds that students can also apply for. Absolutely, Ann. Well, in, implemented inside of the HRSA scholarship program, they have a student support fund. And these funds are available and approved by the HRSA funder per the student reimbursement for social determinants of health payments. And so these funds were approved and made available for students to cover um, such things as Wi-Fi. So each student per month will receive $75 a month to support their Wi-Fi connections. Each student whom are eligible and are approved will receive $100 per month per student for transportation needs. Each student will be uh, receive a $30 um, scholarship to cover their the CHW registry fee. Um, and then other uh, fees that could be approved for a student to cover um, school supplies. For example, if an individual may need a Chromebook, a student will be allowed it $200 per student. Um, other expenses could also be approved, but that's based on the funder and based on the student need at the time. And so we understand that going through a program, it's a commitment and students sometimes experience financial hardship. Yes, so there's both the scholarship and some additional pools of money that can help the student uh, be successful in gaining the certificate. 
So where's the curriculum offered? These are the community colleges that have it. The, the top four are community colleges and then St. Catharines and St. Mary's. Of course, there's a price differential between St. Catharines and St. Mary's and the community colleges. If students are accepted at a community college and get their certificate there, the tuition will be covered in full. It won't be at St. Catharines and St. Mary's, but they may have some other resources to help students as well. Um, and all of the programs are offered um, online. Some have Zoom classes that you attend in real time. Um, some are offered face-to-face, -face, but it is available across the state because of the online um, programs. So, um, we also are working on other things um, to support community health worker development. The Alliance has a really active legislative action committee, and we need it because the CHW field is not moving the way it should be. Um, and so we are working with the Department of Human Services. We would like them to make, um, and we've asked them to make CHW billing more effective. You may not know this, but in 2007, which is a long time ago now, and where the CHW statute was passed by our legislature, it included care coordination as a reimbursable expense. But the Department of Human Services has never made that a part of the rules. So we've never been able to get reimbursed for that. And it is the majority of what CHWs do. So we're working on that. Uh, your help on that would be most appreciated because they need to hear from a lot of us. We've also asked them to do some other things to make billing easier because billing should not be hard. When Hennepin Healthcare is telling us that they're not gonna bill because it's too difficult, something's really wrong with the system. So we have asked DHS to update the CHW manual that's online to make it easier to use and also to offer online videos on how to get the NPI number, how to code and submit for billing. They've done this for community paramedics. So we're asking them to do this for community health workers too, to make it easier to bill. Um, we are also asking this year to improve and expand CHW reimbursement to cover care coordination, to cover outreach and advocacy to other major parts of the job, and to increase the reimbursement rates so that they truly reflect the, the effectiveness of the work of a CHW and help to support positions, and to remove the daily and monthly limits. Um, those limits have not really been breached. They haven't been a big problem. But what we see is that, for example, if a client is diagnosed with diabetes, they may need a lot of time for a week or a month. And after that, they don't need as much time. But if they can have that time up front to learn the things they need to learn about managing their health, that that saves money in the long run. So those limits were put in place, I'm sure, for a reason, but they don't seem to be making sense anymore. So these are some of the things that we're asking for. Um, we also are this year included in Governor Waltz's budget proposal. This is in process right now. It's going to conference committee. The CHW line item was included in the Senate bill, but not in the House bill. So as it goes to conference committee, we need to be communicating with our elected officials, our state representatives, our state senators, and saying this CHW line in the budget is really, really important. It would go to the Department of Health and the Minnesota Community Health Worker Alliance would be a partner in the project. And here's what it would do. At the Alliance, it would help us develop capacity for CHWs to address health disparities and address the social determinants of health. And this includes, but is not limited to COVID-19. It would help us establish a community health worker awareness campaign across the state of Minnesota. One of the things that we're continuously hearing is that this is a, a tremendous need that people don't know about CHWs. They don't know how to use them, how to employ them, how to get in touch with, with community health workers um, and their effects. We, 
They don't know that the return on investment for a community health worker is as low as $3 to $1 invested and goes much higher than that. Um, and we also are ready to increase organizational readiness of employers. We have learned over many time, over many years, that adding CHWs brings a cultural change and there's an element of organizational readiness that organizations need to have to do it successfully. What the funding will do at the Department of Health is fund some exploration of the national and the state CHW landscape, evaluating existing CHW models in, CH, in, in Minnesota. These include some of the hubs, some of the quasi hubs, organizations that function sort of like a hub, but not according to the Pathways Hub Institute model, um, some of the clinical and some of the community-based um, programs for CHWs. And then MDH will be tasked with creating a sustainable plan for CHW infrastructure. So you can help us here and we really need your help. So we're asking you for it. As an organization, you can start talking about CHWs, spread the word about our advocacy work and write a letter or sign on to our, our organizational letter supporting the CHW line item in the governor's budget. Um, on your own, you can contact your own state representative and state senator and tell them how important the community health worker line item is to you. Tell them about your experience with community health workers. And we haven't had much opportunity to testify this year. Angela did testify before the House committee, but the Senate committee has not been holding public hearings. So I don't know if there will be an opportunity to testify before the conference committee, but if there is, that would be a good time to share stories about the effectiveness of community health workers and the need for this funding in the, in the budget. So um, we wanted to leave a lot of time for questions and discussion. So I'm just going to um, let you know that you will get this presentation along with the recording of this presentation. Here are some um, resources that you can access, our, our website, our registry. Uh, we do have supervisor roundtable meetings for CHW supervisors four times a year. That's where we do some peer learning and some problem solving together. Um, we do also have a CHW learning circle, which Angela facilitates for community health workers to meet monthly and interact with each other and learn together. On our website, you can find the state of the community health worker field in Minnesota, a report. It's um, from 2018. So we will need to update that soon. And then the community health worker roles in core local public health. That's also from 2018, but that's, that's stayed pretty true to course. So that's a really great resource for you. So you can become involved by going to our website signing up for our newsletter or reaching out to either one of us. Um, and we'd love to have more people involved, especially helping us with our legislative agenda. And we're going to stop now and I'm going to stop sharing and it's time for you to ask your questions or engage in discussion with us. We're really happy to have this time with you. So can we answer any questions for you? And Angela, thank you so much. Uh, Ellen and I are keeping our eye on the chat and uh, we may have some questions too. Ellen, can you ask uh, a question from the chat? Yeah, there was a question about what is the cost for like educating and training a CHW? Maybe like the average cost since you said there were some differences between the institutions. The scholarships, the HRSA scholarships, are for $3,750 that will per student per, for a year. That will cover the cost of the full cost of the CHW certificate at a community college. It I, I don't know the costs at this at the universities, but I know it's quite a bit higher than that. Um, as, as Angela told you, there's the other pool of money students can apply for. Um, we do also suggest some mentoring for CHW students. Um, if you have several students going through the 
the certificate program together. We have found that it's nice to provide several hours of work time for them to work together on some of their learning. Um, if there's a mentor that can be there with them for that, that's really excellent. If that's not a possibility, providing some work time, so there would be that work time cost too. Because the certificate, most people do it in two semesters, going to school part-time, but working full-time and having a family and all the other life events on top of that as well. Thank you. Do you have a question, Matt, or otherwise I have some more from the chat? Um, I, I'll come back to the chat in a moment. I wanted to ask, uh, Anne, if you could talk a little bit, and Angela, a little bit about how Minnesota compares to other states and where we might be ahead with community health workers and where we might be catching up. Do you want to start that, Angela, with your registry and work with the National Alliance? Yes. Um, well, um, I am also a part of NATUA, which is the National Association of Community Health Workers. And um, we have just recently started a project to help us uh, grow our CHW registry. And um, at to date, we are a national leader in the registry. Um, as far as our advancement and our functionality of our CHW registry, which is a database for CHWs um, to come together and um, create a profile, but be able to communicate with one another across the state um, and share information and also have an opportunity for um, ongoing learning and support of one another, as well as to keep up or abreast of the legislation um, um, sessions and information and content. Um, so what we are planning on doing is collaborating with Natua to help grow the registry and connect us nationally. So I'm representing for region nine, which is Minnesota. Um, and so there um, are a total of 11 regions so far. We are actively recruiting other regions. We have Virginia, we have um, Michigan. We, uh, we also have um, a representative from Hawaii. So that's very interesting to learning what is going on across nationally. So I'm excited about where this um, project will take us. Um, also, they have allotted us some funding to be able to take a deeper dive in um, and grow our registry. So I'm excited about that. And um, we also are um, planning to have a listening session soon. And so it's a community health worker led an incentive. And so what we want to do is capture the voice of CHWs across the state. So I'm interested in um, coming together in a focus group of maybe 20 to 25 CHWs. And I want to get a range of um, thought and input from CHWs of what they would like to see um, in our registry. So it, it sounds, Angela, like the registry is both a way to keep track of community health workers, but also to facilitate communication or conversation. Can you talk a yes. little bit more of it? It's sort of like, then you then you know who to talk to or to speak on behalf of the profession, is that right? Absolutely. As well as there's emergency preparedness piece and a word, an emergency awareness piece. So if there's something that's nationally that we need to know about, um, it will allow us to be able to communicate to one another. And as you know, CHWs are front, frontline public health professionals. So we're able to gain information from one another that's going nationally and band together to figure out how to use our CHW strategies to not only support one another nationally, but support each other within our state as if we ever have another um, situation where we have to prepare for an emergency response. And one more quick question, Ellen, and then we'll go back to the chat. Um, is everybody on the CHDW registry a certificate holder or is the registry open to non-certificate holders? The registry is uh, open to all um, CHWs, um, whether certificate holders or not. Can I add something, Matt? Sure. Um, our curriculum, first of all, we had billing before anyone else. Um, we're still working on getting the billing to work right though. Um, we, our curriculum has held up really, really well when the C3 project looked at, at curriculums, our curriculum was uh, 
it hit every every bullet point that they came up with that was needed. And I mm -hmm. attribute that to the fact that it was a really broad based group of people who worked on it, including CHWs. And our curriculum is in use in over 18 states, not necessarily at the state level, but um, some New Jersey, um, South Dakota, um, and um, Mississippi have all adopted as a state our curriculum. So, and then other people, other places in other states, it's various entities which are using it. So we have been on the forefront for a long time, but it is changing, sort of like pushing a glacier because it changing the medical system, the healthcare field. Um, and so we get frustrated with how slow it sometimes goes. Uh, but we also have to look back at the progress that we've made and we have to grow the field. Yeah. Thank Go you. Ellen. <laughs> Ellen, are there more questions from the chat? I'll, I'll the There's a lot of questions. Them. Yeah. I'm going to go in the order uh, that I received them. And I will say, folks, if we run out of time uh, to get to every question, uh, I saw that Anne and Angela put their contact information on the slides. And I'm, I see nods, so I'm assuming you'd be okay with people reaching out to you? Mm -hmm, sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. So are there any continuing education requirements for CHWs after certification? Not at this time. And I just want to clarify that we do not have certification in Minnesota. Yeah. And that was a conscious decision in 2018. 19, we had a conference, we discussed, it was a statewide conference, we discussed mm -hmm. certification that was not the way the field chose to go at that time in Minnesota, because of the barriers that certification can put up. So we stuck with a certificate program. So students get the graduates get the CHW certificate. And I often hear people saying certification. So I just want to be really clear. That's not what we have. There's no test. There's no certification body. They get a credential from, through an educational institution. There was more to that question, Ellen. What was the other piece of that? Just if there's any continuing ed work. Oh, not at this time, but it's under discussion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome. Um, someone was wondering about the source for the ROI statistic of the three to one ratio. Um, that's on our website. We can get that for you. It's a study. It's a, a literature review of many, many studies done by Carl Rush. Awesome. Um, and that's actually a fairly old. There's there's newer information that shows it's much higher than that. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh -huh. Where are community health workers well involved in community? What are some examples? Um, in senior health, community health workers are being implemented there. Um, behavior health and mental health. Um, I have a, a, a background there. Um, CHW, child maternal health. Um, CHWs have a broad uh, spectrum of workforce that are integrated in. One of the things is, as CHWs don't all commonly go by community health worker or CHWs. They could be peer support specialists. They could be system navigators. They could be care coordinators. They, you know, it's just a CHW is an umbrella term. Um, some um, health systems use them as cultural brokers or um, promotoras. Um, so there's various names uh, for community health workers. Yeah. Are there specific communities? where they're more involved? Like mm -hmm. geographic communities, are they in <laughs> urban and, and rural, Minneapolis or St. Paul? Yes, CHWs are statewide. We do have CHWs in rural communities. Um, the more concentrated number of community health workers are in the Metro Twin Cities area. What might be the overlap between community health workers and like clinical interpreters? They're two distinct positions with different scopes of practice. Um, we get asked this a lot, can my community health worker serve as my interpreter too? And the answer is really legal and ethically no, because they have two different roles. The interpreter is there to interpret word for word. 
The CHW is there as support, advocacy, helping someone to understand. So they may have to do explaining as well as interpreting word for word. So would a CHW in a pinch interpret if needed? Of course, because their, their client needs that. But should you rely on a community health worker to do interpreting at all times? No, you shouldn't. Could you also talk some about the differences between community health workers and community paramedics? Sure. Um, and there was a great study done on the community health worker, community paramedic team by Medtronic. I don't know if you are familiar with the Health Rise study, um, but they paired a community paramedic with a community health worker. And what they found was great outcomes on lowering blood pressure, um, managing diabetes. And clients loved it. What clients said was, I didn't have to go to the doctor all the time. They came to my house because the CP, the community paramedic, can do the medical pieces, but they don't do what a CHW does. And so they would turn it over to the CHW for the resource connection, the social determinants of health, some of the health education, especially culturally specific health education. So the community paramedics and the community health workers literally loved that partnership and spoke highly of each other and the, and the distinct roles that they had. And the people that they served loved it because they had fewer clinical visits, they got their services at home, and the providers loved it because their patients improved. Yeah, it's interesting to hear all the differences and how people can have very specific scopes of work to build out kind of a whole network to support yeah. the holistic needs that people have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could you share about advocacy efforts to ensure livable and equitable pay for CHWs is part one. And part two is what is the pay level that employers should consider? Um, well, you know, when we had national speakers here, they said that a livable wage now is $25 an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's, and the, I, I have a calculator for Minnesota that goes by if you're a single parent with a child or two children or, um, so it's all up there. I mean, and I know that CHWs have long been paid much lower than that, but um, I saw that Michelle Harry is here from WellShare today. She could probably share some stories about turnover because in the current environment, we have to pay a livable wage. Um, so what we're doing to help support that livable wage is working on reimbursement that's critical. Getting reimbursement levels up there, getting reimbursement to work is critical for helping to sustain CHW positions. Um, so I see Michelle came on. Do you wanna add anything, Michelle? Sure, yeah, no, thanks, Anne. We, um, I would say his, in recent history, our average rate of pay has been around 24, 25. We are constantly having to watch that and it's been creeping up further. What's um, one of the things that I think organizations really need to look at in order to achieve that, and Welshire has been on a journey now for the last few years to, to try to affect this, is you almost have to rework your whole business model. So um, this has been a time of a lot of dynamic change internally in order to pay a competitive wage, you know, which at a minimum is livable. You know, ideally we can all pay more than just what's livable, right? That's like the bare floor. Mm -hmm. um, we're having to get really creative in terms of, you know, old fashioned days, we would just, we'd get a grant and we'd write in two or three CHWs and there'd be a rate. Well, MDH contracts are not keeping up with cost of living increases. They're straight line and they have for a few years now. So you can no longer, you know, pay people livable wages with only a grant. We're having to combine different revenue streams, and then that's how we're trying to put packages together that are really attractive and will help us retain folks. Um, so that's from the perspective of a community-based organization. If you talk to folks in health systems, clinical systems, health insurance, government, you know they have they're navigating it slightly differently. So I don't want to speak for all employers of CHWs. That's the community-based organization experience right now. 
And we do know that the um, hospital in St. Cloud added a CHW to their um, pediatrics department because they, they saw the cost savings. They were able to pay for it. Mayo Health System has done the same thing. They've added CHWs paying for them through cost savings. So um, I wish we could share their cost savings information with you, but that's seen as proprietary information, but they have two CHWs on so that are just coming out of the budget. So there is that is a possibility for the health systems and clinics. And of course, federally qualified health systems should have CHWs as part of their um, interdisciplinary team. The next question is related. Um, since CHWs can fill a wide range of roles, how does billing work since there is so much variety? Is the same regardless? of the service or does the CHW employer build different rates for different services or relationships? There's just a few codes for billing and it's largely around um, health education, diagnosis related health education. Uh, that's what we're working on is getting there to be more that can be billed for. In particular, that um, care coordination or system navigation, which is so much of what CHWs do. I think that when the legislation was passed, there was a fear at the Department of Human Services that it was going to cost way too much money to, to um, uh, support CHW care coordination. And care coordination is a term that's used across many different positions. But the result of them not including it has been to um, make it very difficult to bill to sustain a CHW position. And that has to change. Yeah, thank you. Right, mm -hmm. Marie is saying FQHCs can't bill. No, but they're supposed to have community health workers as part of their, their model. Gosh, there's a lot of questions. I'm slow, everybody. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> being on the registry with you all is different from being registered with MDH as a certified CHW, yes? There is no certified CHW registry with MDH because there is no certification in Minnesota. So, so yeah, uh, so our yeah. registry is what there is. There, the, the, the two things that you can have is the CHW certificate credential, mm -hmm. which comes from the co a college, um, and you can sign up on our registry. So, Ramo, I'm going to suggest maybe connecting with Ann and Angela, and they can help. Um, you navigate that um, and answer maybe more specific questions that you have. Um, the next question is about if CHWs are trained or able to work with families who endure trauma from loss of life connected to gun violence. I'm going to have Angela answer that. CHWs are widely trained um, and um, each organization um, has specific training that when they hire on a CHW that they can train them and delegate them to do. We don't do clinical, um, we don't commonly do clinical tasks, um, but we, we can if delegated and trained and supervised by a medical professional such as a nurse or, or, or other um, to do blood pressures, vitals, um, glucose screenings and such. Um, ongoing trainings comes through such as the CHW Alliance, we have the circle that we offer. Um, we have organizations or experts come in and do training around health coaching and various chronic uh, disease management, body systems, and various things like that. Um, there's other entities that may have specific training for CHWs. And we know that every CHW sees clients with trauma and trauma history. Um, on our website, there's also three webinars about trauma where we had uh, fantastic experts from across Minnesota um, teaching us about trauma and um, historical trauma, um, culturally specific strategies to address trauma. So I really recommend those, um, those webinars that are on our website about trauma. Thank you. Could you share about uh, CHWs within tribal communities 
any examples or ways um, that you've seen that working? Sure. Um, we see community health representatives, tribes have community health representatives, and uh, they have a little bit different training than community health workers. We would like to get our certificate program to tribal communities as well, because we think it provides, um, it would provide some more variety in what the people who are now community health workers and others could do and, and get reimbursed for. Um, so, and of course, across rural Minnesota, we need more community health workers and tri the tribes are part of that as well, so. Thank you. Could you talk a little more about CHW hubs? What they're like um, and maybe where there are CHW hubs in Minnesota? Sure, um, there are two pathways community hub institute hubs. That's a specific model from Ohio. They are in um, the Twin Cities, Pillsbury United Community has one going, and the, the other one is in Winona. Winona Health is behind um, that one. So they are getting their feet under them. But then there are other um, hub type models. The Intercultural Mutual Assistance Association in Rochester is one of those where they're a community based organization. They have 14 CHWs who work with Mayo Clinic um, with a lot of their family practice clinics. Um, and um, also WellShare, I would say, is a hub type model where you have your CHWs employed in a community-based organization, but they go, they're multifaceted and they go out and do many different things. Bemidji is in the process of exploring a hub model. Um, the Duluth and Arrowhead region are also in the process of exploring a hub model. Um, and am I forgetting some, Angela? That's that's who I'm thinking of right now. Yeah, I think I think you covered them all that we're aware of so far. So that one is a one is a a, a, a specific model. You have to sign up with Pathways Community Hub Institute in Ohio, and follow their their model. And the others are more flexible. Mm -hmm. I see that a link to the Twin City Stage W Hub um, that's affiliated with Pillsbury is linked to in the chat. If folks okay. need to scroll up a little bit uh, to get to that, uh, I did, and I will note. Oh yeah, sorry. I did put our registry link in the hub too, or in the chat too. Yeah. Thank you. And we also, um, when we pull up our slides, we'll show that we're going to have another event. Um, MPHA is in June. Um, where my colleague uh, who works at the Mankato CHW Hub through Wellshare is going to come and talk about some concrete work. And I will okay. add, MPHA has been a longtime supporter of CHWs. And so if anyone else on this call wants to like connect about doing an event or anything like that, we are happy to. <laughs> yeah. And, and or the audience. So uh, just want to, yeah. as we're nearing the top of the hour, I think we still have time for a few more questions, but um, we do have a short survey and we already uh, excited and, and impressed by the number of people that both signed up and turned out today. That shows there's interest. If you're interested in this topic, please weigh in on the, in the survey uh, so we can express to our MPHA colleagues that it's not just that Ellen and I are interested in community health workers, yeah. but that there's clearly an audience for that. Um, and help us, um, you know, I think, uh, Ann and Angela have given us a nice foundation. If there are specific aspects that you would like us to look for speakers, um, like we're, you know, we, you know, we could probably go around uh, some of the hubs that were just there and give, you know, it sounds like there are different types of hub models. There are uh, hubs in different parts of the state or there are community health workers in different, uh, different areas. Uh, I think, you know, help us by completing the survey. Uh, like you said, uh, reach out to Ellen and I if you're interested in presenting, but also if you're just interested in the present, you know, hearing more about a certain aspect of it. This is all, uh, you know, we see community health workers as part of our public health workforce, one of the main ways that we can help close some of these health equity gaps. And we're interested in investing more than uh, one webinar. If we can demonstrate to our colleagues and our supporters out there and to our membership that this is uh, something people want to talk about. Uh, and I'd say it, it must be because we've got, uh, we've had at least a half hour of questions. I think Anne and Angela, it was good for you to, 
uh, share time for discussion because then yeah. we can drive the conversation where people want to go. Um, I saw one question that I didn't hear you ask, Ellen, and it was just specifically yeah. about the HealthWise study. It was just whether it's on the CHW Alliance website. You know, it's not. Um, we can connect with Medtronic and see if we can, uh, if the, if they have a link that we could link to or something. It was a, it was done by Medtronic, so I'll look into that. Okay. Ellen, were there other questions in the chat? Yes. How many folks are on the registry? Oh, do you remember that, Angela? I don't remember that. I don't either. Um, the answer is it's growing. Yes, yeah, definitely. You could so. just say that's your answer. <laughs> um, um, just uh, this week alone, there was an enrollment of over 40. Um, and as um, the HRSA grant continues to roll out, there will be 90 students each semester. And that's just a caveat over the next two and a half years. Um, but there's always great interest in the, um, in the registry. And the more that we do the outreach and do the awareness and notoriety, we get an influx of those enrollments. And it's going to be really fun to start pulling information out of the registry. We do have one tiny little piece right now. It's a map that shows where the um, uh, CHWs who are in the registry are located in the state just by big regions. And um, they are largely concentrated in the seven county metro area. So it's going to be fun to be able to pull information out of that for use as we grow the field. Are there communities or universities outside the Twin Cities metro area where you can pursue the, the CHW curriculum and credential? Yes, um, Northwest Technical College in Bemidji, Minnesota West in Worthington, Rochester Community and Technical College in Rochester. And then um, all of them have online models. So you can, you can get it online. I know online doesn't work for everyone, um, but if, if it can work for you, you can, you can be in Southern Minnesota and go to Northwest Tech or be in Northern Minnesota and go to Minnesota West, so. So in rural areas, people can either get it online or maybe they can travel to one of the, one of the non-metro locations. Yeah, and Normandale does a lot with Zoom classes where you do have a regular class time and you meet with your teacher and there's lecture and class activities. I think we have one more <clears throat> question. Are there any specific recommendations that you know of for community-based organizations in terms of supporting CHWs, uh, in terms of emotional, social, cultural support, especially for those that are doing a lot of work around mental health and trauma? Yeah, I'm gonna have Angela weigh in on that, but I will start by saying you need to have supervisor time and a supervisor who understands the role and the trauma impact and the secondary trauma impact and has time so that if something happens, the CHW can problem solve and process with them. Um, you also have to be ready for the organizational change that comes with a CHW when information starts flowing back to the organization in a way that it hasn't before. And I will stop there. Absolutely. Um, so it starts with the champion of the supervisors, understanding that role and how to support that um, CHW, but understanding that CHW is, is a non-traditional profession. And so we go beyond the clinical and organizational walls. So it's common that a CHW can have an office, a cubicle, or a space within the organization, but not occupy those stations because we're out in the communities. We're the boots on the ground. So we're the ones that are out in the homes, in the facilities in, you know, um, uncommon areas that clinicians or community-based organizations uh, don't have the staffing to go. And so understanding and how to support CHWs, um, how to train them to be safe and how understand and have a safety protocol for CHWs, have that connection with the CHWs. So therefore, they're not siloed or feel like they're isolated or alone. Thank and, you. Angela and Ann, thank you so much for your time today. You. Ellen, any last questions before we wrap up? No, I do not see any other questions. Okay, I'm in a, uh, we did have, uh, can you see my slide about upcoming events? Yeah. 
Yep. Um, thank you, Angela and Anne, for this presentation. Um, like I was just saying, I think uh, Ellen and I and others at the Public Health Association are really interested in um, whether there are other questions uh, you want to uh, that you want answered. Uh, we we plan to do more webinars, and you know, based on the great turnout today, uh, going to do at least one more webinar around community health workers. But uh, help us by filling out that survey. I wanted to let people know about a couple of other quick upcoming events from the Minnesota Public Health Association. Uh, we do have our Public Health Matters Policy Forum series um, about safety is no accident. So public health approaches to injury prevention. Um, that's on May 12th from 7.30 to 8, 9.30. Uh, the Public Health Association has our annual conference, May 22nd to 23rd. Uh, it's in person at Concordia College in Moorhead, but there are virtual options uh, to attend. So encourage anybody interested in that to check that out on our website. Uh, and uh, community health intervention, uh, I'm sorry, community health innovation is the next webinar that we have uh, planned. We should have registration out uh, later this week on June 15th. But if you have other ideas for uh, details you'd like us uh, to look into, uh, let us know. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Anne and Angela uh, talked about uh, the legislature still in session. Uh, so if you haven't talked to your elected officials yet, now is a good time to weigh in. Uh, there was financial support for the governor's recommendation in the Senate bill, uh, not so much in the House bill. So we're going to need to do some work the next couple of weeks. But even when that work is done, uh, there's more work to be done pushing that uh, that glacier. So uh, knock on wood, we'll be successful with the legislature in the short term. But uh, there may be things for us to come back and uh, ask all of you for both ideas about uh, what you could do to help, but also ideas about what you think needs to be done. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, Mary, I wanna make sure that you have a chance. Let's see. Oh, uh, Policy and Advocacy Committee uh, for the Minnesota Public Health Association meets the first Wednesday of every month. So we actually meet tomorrow. Health Equity meets the third Thursday of the month uh, and membership and communications are monthly and rotating. With that, I'll stop sharing. Uh, Mary, so that you can throw um, our um, evaluation into the chat. There we go.